welcome Jesus, and thank you for doing this interview. Um, as you know, I'm Anzo Pollock, and I'm quite fascinated about the universe in general. Yep. And um, I'd like to ask some questions about your experiences from your perspective yep. about the universe in general. Um, I have Mary Magdalene with me, <laughs> who won't be conduct, who won't be answering questions, but will be assisting. In I'll be asking. Okay. 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 So, um, no worries. So the way I thought I'd start it is, uh, I actually had thought, how would you compare man's definition versus you know, your definition and, and from God's perspective about what the universe really is. So I went to the concise Collins Dictionary yeah. and they defined the universe as, well, they didn't give a complete, they didn't give a complete uh, definition. They provided three alternatives. So I thought I'd just read it to you. The universe is defined as A, astronomy, the aggregate of all existing matter, energy and space from the Latin universum, meaning the whole world. Yeah. Or B, uh, human beings collectively, or C, province or sphere of thought or activity. Yeah. Now, how do these man's definitions accurately define the universe? Well, and uh, I sort of feel like the way man defines the universe is very, um, is quite rigid and quite, and quite limited as well. Because the way God created the universe and the man and the way man sees the universe is very, very different. So when man examines the universe, he sees the universe from his own perspective outwards. Whereas um, when you get to see have other p- perspectives, and in particular when you connect with God more fully, you start to have God's perspective of the universe. And God's perspective of the universe is very, very different to man's perspective of the universe. A lot of times what happens with man's perspective is they firstly see the universe, particularly men on Earth, see the universe as a physical universe. In other words, there are things that they see and uh, or can measure that they cannot see um, with instruments, you know, measure with instruments, even though they cannot see, and they then define that as matter. But recently, of course, there's been a lot of developments where man started to realise that for many of their theories to be correct, they have to come up with concepts such as antimatter and or, or and dark matter um, and dark energy and dark flow. These are all concepts that men are using now to define certain aspects of the universe. But they're all still very much uh, analysing the physical aspect of the universe. And they realise that there's things they cannot see, um, but there's still this very strong focus on what can be seen and what can be measured. And and God's perception of the universe and God's creation of the universe is very different to that, of course. Also, as you progress uh, spiritually, you as you come to know God's ideas about the universe, you start seeing a very, very different universe than what mankind believes actually exists. Mm. And, uh, and this incorporates even their beliefs about how the universe came into existence and how the universe is maintained. All of these things are all very different um, than what mankind currently conceives them to be. So how would you define, (coughs) what would you define as being the universe? Do you have the same perspective as what God would have? Well, um, perhaps we can, we need to define two areas of the universe. One is the universe that is currently in existence. which is a what I would call a, a combination of universes uh, rather than just the, as man sees our the galaxy and therefore the universe that we exist in as one universe. There are actually a combination of these physical universes, many of them, and, but there are also a combination of spiritual universes. So there's, there's the universe that man sees, then there, or the universes that man sees, then there's the universes that man does not see, but does come to see when they pass, when they die. And then there is also the physical structure that God has placed so that the universe has the capacity to create more universes. So if you look at what God sees, God has created a, a system of laws that allow for future universes to come into existence, beyond which are currently in existence. So so there are, if you like, a framework that God has created, and then there is the physical universes 
some of which are material in nature, some of which are spiritual in nature, and some of which I would classify as soul in nature. And, and then there's all of those ones in soul in nature yet to be created, but God has placed in place the structure for their creation. So does God create, you mentioned that the universe can create more universes. How does the create like does God create the other universes or has inbuilt the potential within our universe for more creation? Well, firstly, when it comes to the physical universe, yes, God created the physical universe that came into existence purely from God's desire and passion and energy. So that's the matter that we that's know. the matter that we yep. that we have. Yep. And then God's love and and laws create the structure of other potentials occurring based on this mankind getting in the condition of the creation of those other potentials. So if if we can illustrate that properly, um, it's like the physical universe was created, and by the way, uh, part of the physical universe was spiritual in nature, so there was a spiritual portion of the universe that was created at the same time. And we we call that, or what we've been calling that or terming that is, is... up to the sixth dimension of the spiritual world, all of that came into existence at the original inception, if you like, of creation. God created that. So, sorry, just to clarify, that spiritual realm, Mm -hmm. God created this physical realm, which is what, as people on earth, without any kind of religious or spiritual background, we accept as the universe, scientifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you're saying that there's a spiritual realm Yes. Uh, which is a place where spirits exist? Or? Yes, with, with yep. matter. It has matter right. of a subliminated form, but it has matter. It has uh, very, very similar physical matter that you can touch and feel and so forth. Um, and you can, and it, was pro- it progresses in love up to the, what's called the sixth dimension of the spirit, of the spirit world or the sixth sphere. Yeah. And all of that came into existence as far as it is known because nobody was present at the time. As far as it is known, it came into existence through God's creation, through God's creation of this process, if you like. Yeah. And um, But every other dimension above that, or every other universe above that, has come into, into creation, not from God's effort, but rather from God's laws interacting with man's effort. Mm. So in other words, um, once a person who is human progresses to a certain uh, condition of love, spontaneously, once they reach that condition of love, this next universe or dimension is created like that. So a new part of the universe. So a new part of the universe is born and comes into existence. Yeah. So the universe is in existence in a current structure, in a, in a defined field. Um, Def- what do you mean by that, Anto? Like, if there is a physical... If you say that there's a physical realm, and yep. there's a spiritual realm, and there's a potential for another realm, how does that exist within the universe? Um, well, not the potential. There is another realm. So there's the physical, the spiritual, and the soul-based realms are all in existence. But uh, the, the soul-based realms have been created through the effort of man interacting with the laws that God created. So, so it's a bit like um, when we first came here on Earth, the very first time when mankind was placed on earth, there was no physical house for a person to live in. But there was the matter around or surrounding the person where they could create the house if they so desired, if they used their will and, and their knowledge of, of technology, they could then create something or cause something to come into existence. Does that make sense? So... so so if you think about that from, the, from a larger perspective, instead of, instead of it just being this small perspective of like we can create a house and we create a house from the different elements of the earth, if you can think of the larger perspective being we can create a universe, you personally can create a universe, if, and the very first person who gets into the condition of love to create that the universe spontaneously comes into existence because of the passion and desire of the individual. And now, but, but the skeleton of that universe, or the laws that control that universe, have already been created, have already been created by God. 
I'm just wondering. Okay, that was a brief, inter brief <laughs> interlude because you. of the yeah. uh, rain. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to ask, you were talking about creation and you were saying that um, you are talking about the creation of new spheres or new realms through man's effort. Mm -hmm. So my question is about creation and the way it's perceived on the planet at the moment. We have the theory of the Big Bang, mm -hmm. And then we also have the Christian theory of the seven days that God used to create. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me from what you're saying that God God did have a period of creation, but we, at that time he also inbuilt inside of what he created the potentialities for new creations. Mm -hmm. But are they always going to be as a result of man's will? No, it's a combination of two things. If we, if we can look firstly what you call the potentialities, yes. they are really a group of laws. Yes. So, so God's created this framework or structure by which things can be created. So, for example, here on Earth it's not often seen, but we do have things like genetic modification here on Earth where, where man can create a new type of uh, plant or um, experimenting with animals, but yeah. new type of plant at this point. And... Um, based on the genetic manipulation of the genetic code, and that is a type of creation. And God put into place the laws that allow that particular type of creation. If it's done in a loving manner, it can always benefit humanity. If it's done in an, unlo un an unloving manner, it will be to humanity's detriment. Then God has also put into place a whole heap of laws in the spirit world, and there are many spirits who are completely aware that they can bring into, they can create on their own accord, but they can't actually give life to their creations. To give life to their creations, they've got to always ask God's assistance in the process of giving life to their creation. Mm -hmm. But they can genetically manipulate things uh, and create from scratch uh, new creations, even animals and, and, and birds and other creatures, for example. And they can genetically modify them in such a way so they've got the form but, they, but the life, if you like, comes from God. So is that the case with all creation? Um, with regard to the life? Life, yes. Certainly. So yes. the life has to come from God. <clears throat> then, there's, then there's the type of creation where we have yet, as humankind, and I'm including the spirits in the spirit world, we have yet to actually conceive of what we want to create, because we don't even we don't even know that we can create those particular things, and yet God has already put into place the laws yes. that we can discover to allow those creations as well. And so, I see the laws as a framework, the the foundation of all creation. So, so what God has done is is created this law based framework, with which He can now like involve us in the process of creation. Some people call it co-creation, um, where, where we, once we learn about those particular laws, now have the ability to create within the framework of those particular laws. Right, so I have more questions about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so does that mean then that... God does that mean then that if God created the framework for creation to occur, that perhaps the Big Bang is correct and the seven days of creating everything in the universe as perhaps Christian faith would dictate, which is truer or which is true, is any of it true? And if, given that what you're describing is about laws which govern the ability for change and creation to happen on earth not necessarily as a result of um, God pointing his finger and creating the thing but a, almost an evolution of things mm -hmm. so where does science fit with God and what about this is a many questions now I'm asking but you've asked about seven or eight yes but, so, but can we can we perhaps minimize it down a bit Yes. Firstly, um, is the Bible account of creation correct? Well, uh, firstly, the Bible account of creation was never meant to be a definitive day-by-day -day description that mankind has now interpreted it to be. The people who originally wrote that account of creation um, it, it wanted to use it as an analogy of what God had done. Um, and it was also taken from the standpoint of Earth 
rather than from the standpoint of the universe. Yes. So, of course, the, the way in which things unfolded on the Earth was very, very different to the way in which things unfolded before the Earth came into existence as a, and formed itself as a planet. And before, even as a planet, it started to uh, change in terms of turning from gas into, into solid matter and so forth. So, so all of these different things um, of what happened to the Earth prior to that account that's written in Genesis of the Bible uh, are all still things that have occurred. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't see it as an either-or mm -hmm. type of solution. Mm -hmm. I see it as, well, no, there are certain truths in terms of the in terms of the timing of the types of creation that occurred um, that that are mentioned in the creative account of Genesis, and there are but but the creative account of Genesis was never meant to be definitive, in the sense of a description of God on this particular twenty four hour day created this, and on the next twenty four hour day created this, and so forth. Now some in the have interpreted the Bible to say. Well, 1,000 years is as one day with God. So, so they then assume that every 1,000 years God did those particular things, but it's still the same description in the end. Like, so, so at the end, God, the Bible account of creation was never meant to be taken so literally. So that's important to understand. Yes. Secondly, um, mankind has come up with many theories through the observation of the universe as to how the universe came into existence. They are still theories because many of them cannot be proven uh, beyond all doubt, and so therefore they still retain a theory. They are still a theory. The Big Bang is one of those theories. It's the most favoured theory by scientists at this point in time, by the majority of scientists, I should say, because not all agree, but it is the most favoured theory by the majority of sci scientists uh, by uh, the Big Bang theory of creation of the physical universe. But but I'm talking about all these other universes mm. that don't exist that have not even been discovered as in, in the minds even of the persons analysing yeah. it, let alone their desire to investigate it. However, if we look at the Big Bang Theory, there are a number of theories that have been added to it in order to explain how particular things occur. So there's the initial Big Bang Theory. Now, with the initial Big Bang, there would normally be an explosion, which would eventually have a certain amount of distance by which it could expand, and then it would stay in that particular place and it wouldn't continuously expand. And so what they did is they came up with another theory called inflation theory, where the universe went through a big initial big bang and then perhaps even a few seconds, they say, after that, or less after that big bang, it went through a very rapid inflation. So they come up with this inflation theory and, and then the universe is sort of, you could think of it as expanding in all directions. And then they found that actually certain things weren't expanding, they were contract contracting. Mm -hmm. and, and so they had to come up with even more theories. And so they came up with a theory about dark matter. Dark matter was a theory created because, because they couldn't understand how galaxies work. And they decided that, that the, they measured the speed of the rotational speed of galaxies and they found that the outside rotational speed was very, very similar to the inside rotational speed of a galaxy. And, and as a result of that, they realised that there must be more dent, more matter in this galaxy than they could have physically observed. And so they came up with the idea that there's antimatter or, mm -hmm. or dark matter, mm -hmm. matter that they cannot observe but has the same kind of, uh, particularly dark matter, matter that they cannot observe but has the same kind of forces on the galaxy to cause the galaxy to have the same rotational speed on the outside and its inside. But then, then they had a problem with, with regard to what was happening between the galaxies because the, due to gravitational pull, normally the galaxies should be being pulled together. Mm -hmm. But the galaxies are not being pulled together. They could measure that the galaxies are actually pulling apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And so they had to come up with another theory, and that, that theory was dark energy, which explains the process of the splitting away of the galaxies, the, the way that the galaxies are kept apart. And there's all this energy that they believe must be there, but they call it dark because nobody's ever measured it and nobody knows what it is. And nobody can see it. And nobody can mm. see it, yes. uh, but, but they believe it must be present mm. and because if it, if it wasn't present, these, this particular thing wouldn't be happening to the galaxies. Mm. And then um, they found, uh, only very recently actually, that uh, all of the galaxies, for some reason, instead of flowing away from a central point, were actually flowing in the same direction. 
mm-hmm. which, in, which indicates that they're flying somewhere, from somewhere, to somewhere. And so, so what they then did is they come up with another theory on top of the... So this is all part of now the Big Bang Theory. These, the Big Bang, the original Big Bang Theory being modified by inflation, modified by dark matter, modified by dark energy, and now modified by a thing they call dark flow. Mm-hmm. So, so where, they, where they try to explain that all of the... They can measure it physically, that all of the galaxies are moving in a certain direction. Now, this is what we do as mankind. We come up with the original theory. It doesn't work. And so what we do is we add another theory to, to, to that theory to explain what's happening that, of what we measured. And then that doesn't work fully. And so we add another theory to it. And then that doesn't work fully. So we add another theory to it. And then that doesn't work. And we add another theory to it. And in the end, nobody's come up with a better explanation. So we all accept it as if it's true. Yeah. Um, now, that, that is not a very, in a way, a very scientific analysis of, of the universe. But, but it's the best many of us have. Because the only way we have of measuring this particular universe in which we're living is through the physical. And this is the primary problem that man has, is we're so focused on measuring the truth about the universe and its its creation on the physical that we're not understanding the rest of the universe that we cannot see that actually does exist, that we can communicate with and find out about quite simply. Mm -hmm. And this is where I feel there are a lot of problems. So I feel the Christians, on one hand, severely limit themselves by believing in the seven-day creative process, um, particularly the ones who limit themselves by thinking that it's literal literal or semi-literal in the sense of a thousand years for one day, but still literal. Um, They limit themselves in that direction. Plus, they're not allowing communication with people who have passed because of the different laws in the Bible which say that to do so means you're communing with the devil. And so they cannot find out about anything about what happens after they pass in terms of... and also about where where other matter exists. And then on the scientific edge, it's almost as religious, again, but in a different direction. It's got a heap of theories that they've come up with that all seem to correctly... um, portray the universe at present but if we understand how those theories came about it was an initial theory added to another theory added to another theory added to another theory and added to another theory that eventually created this complete complex system and it's accepted by the majority of people because basically the mathematics explains it but but there's a whole different there's a whole lot of things that mathematics explains as well that they do not accept for example, mathematics displays uh, to, uh, quite, quite conclusively um, shows that there are other other dimensions mm. that they cannot see, and, and yet and yet they don't believe that they can communicate with such dimensions, and that life exists or that life exists in those dimensions, yeah. and so it's very very hard for them to find out the truth about mm. how the universe actually is. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm actually curious as to through all your experiences and in your travels through the spirit world uh, over 2,000 years, mm-hmm. how would you actually define it as how God's created the universe? Have you discovered why God did it and how he, God has actually created it? Um, certainly have discovered why God created the universe because that is a very, very simple... <laughs> that's a very simple answer to that question. In terms of how the universe actually works, to, to draw it as a three-dimensional model is quite complex, as you can imagine, mm. to... You, you've, you've got in our visible universe literally trillions of galaxies. Um, obviously, to draw how those particular uh, this particular physical universe in which we're living is actually operating in a three dimensional sort of a model as a summary is quite complex. But, okay. if, but so, if I can illustrate it, mm, to yeah. gain some perspective for ourselves, yep. where where does Earth sit within that? that you're talking about. Um, Physicals. Earth, Earth is, unlike what many of the Christians of old used to think, Earth is not the centre of the universe. <laughs> Earth is just one planet surrounding one solar system which surrounds one uh, dark hole, uh, black hole, which surrounds another black hole at the centre of our galaxy, which surrounds other matter, what the scientists are co- currently calling dark energy, which is surrounded and then joins together in a flow. And so, so many of these things are actually happening. But but the Earth is really a, a like is not a core part of this entire universe. It's one of many thousands of similar planets on, in the universe that are available for for 
mankind's existence and, and we could easily find many other planets and live on, there are people living on many other planets who are in a very similar state of development than ourselves. It's an amazing concept. <laughs> um, so, so we are not the centre of the universe <laughs> and uh, I think the, the Earth being the centre of the universe comes from the concept that most people have that they are the centre of the universe and uh, we're not uh, either of those particular things. Um, the, the reality is God created many billions and billions of children and each child has the ability to live on one of these earths um, through this process of incarnation that is described in the Secrets of the Universe discussion. And, and God created this universe primarily as a demonstration of her love for the children that she created. So the main reason why God created this entire structure, because God doesn't need it to exist. There's a common concept today that God is the universe. But the reality is that God existed before the universe came into existence. And as a result of that, God doesn't need the universe in order to exist. So from what I would understand by that statement, that would mean God would actually be standing separately. To the universe. Yes, if you if you can see, and this is a very very simple representation. But perhaps if I drew something uh, as a concept, if you could you could think of God, who has masculine and feminine qualities, sitting outside of what she creates, which is all of this. Now, in that, let's call her that call that the universe. And I'm not talking about our physical universe here. I'm talking about many many hundreds and thousands potentially of universes that all exist. Now, every one of these universes is sort of like broken up like an orange where you've got separations of boundaries of love that you can progress through and then there's other universes. Now, drawing them like that is not a good idea because you only conceive of it as an orange, but reality is it's very similar to the way galaxies rotate in a, in a three-dimensional uh, double helix tyroidal type of uh, rotational pattern so so you've got literally these hundreds of these that can be that can spontaneously come into existence through the desire of a person even getting to a certain condition of love that allows for this creation to occur so physically you in your future god has allowed this potential that physically you in your future could create one of these complex universes which is broken up into many different facets, all separated by love, and you have the ability to actually create them. Do you feel that you have actually created? Certainly. Certainly. Every, so every universe above the, the sixth dimension, I have personally created through this process that God has allowed, right up until the soul union condition when Mary and I entered the soul union condition, and in that moment, we created... The, the the universe that we lived in in that location, so so and and all of these universes are basically, if you like, the ones that you are going to potentially live in throughout the rest of your life, have been created by myself and Mary. Do we need to actually go through the spirit world to understand and learn all? Yes, yeah, generally you do because it's very complicated from a scientific and and, and mathematical and physical processes. But, but it's very simple if you understand love. So, so, but if you can conceive that God created, not this isn't, the, if you like, the universe that God created. You could say this is the laws that allowed the universe to come into existence. So what I see God doing primarily is creating the laws that create, that create or the framework in which this these universes can pop into existence based on the condition of love of the individual's desires and passions. So, so potentially, this is an ever-expanding universe which is combined of all of these universes all rotating in directions. They all have rota physical directions in which they rotate and so forth. They all have laws. Each one of these has specific laws. And when you understand the laws, you can create one. It's just a matter of coming to understand the laws. And all of the laws, the highest law is the law of divine love, 
So all of the all of the laws are subservient to this underlying law, the laws surrounding divine love. So once you learn those laws, then you can understand how to go about this process of creation. And each component will just integrate seamlessly with each other, not yes, haphazardly affect one another. No, because this framework that God has created is orderly. God, God never allows anarchy in the universe. So there is an orderly framework. What mankind has measured as uh, what they believe is spontaneous or random events, there is actually no random event in no the chaos universe. theory. Yeah, well, chaos theory in itself is, is mathematical and therefore not random. Mm. It, 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 the mathematical formulas promote seemingly random, seeming randomness, but the reality is it's a mathematical formula, so therefore it's, potenti it's potentially predictable. So you're saying there's meaning to everything that occurs in our universe? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So man existing in its current form, just living day to day, are they haphazardly creating something in the universe? Well, the, the sad, to I suppose the sad thing about what man does generally is that, is that because, because we're not conscious, and when I say conscious, let's use the term because I do not understand... The, the laws or the framework that, through which I can create. I start uh, creating through my desires, and, uh, and in fact that is a law that I'm not conscious of, mm. but I start creating. But unfortunately, many of my creations are antagonistic to my own happiness because many of my desires are out of harmony with love. And so what happens is I exercise my desires out, out of harmony with love. I start creating things many things of which are, are actually you know, painful for me to experience, but, but I'm not understanding, because I don't understand the laws involved, that they're all surrounding love, I then start looking at, well, how did that come into existence? And why did that particularly random event seem to happen? And, but there is no random event, and there is no, um, so, nothing that hasn't been created by your own soul. And so... And so what we need to come to understand is that once we understand the laws, then we'll begin to understand how to actually create in a conscious manner, in a, in a manner that is only ever beneficial. That's, that's the challenge that fa faces humanity. Um, humanity at the moment is creating, but many times unconsciously, or, or you could say consciously negatively, in a sense that in a, in a painful direction, purposefully, and, and of course, there is going to only there can only be negative consequences of those kind of creations in a framework where only creations that are loving can exist permanently. The creations that are unloving must eventually disappear. So God has written that into his laws, basically. Yes. Yeah. So, so there is nothing that can permanently exist in the universe that is of an unloving nature. It can temporarily exist as long as the will of the free will of an individual is exercised in that direction. It can temporarily exist. However, there will also be a temporary experience of pain or suffering as a result of its existence, which is the feedback system that God uses to show us that we're out of harmony with the laws of love of creation. Yeah. So from what you're saying, what you drew there on the board, really God's creation is about laws that govern matter is that what you yes spiritual and, it, and not just matter? even govern matter but actually allow for the uh, the existence of matter even yeah. the the laws themselves are, are beyond matter yes. this is what's so fascinating about yes. them uh, is the laws themselves exist beyond matter but they affect matter so it's a bit like if you analyze the law of gravity for example like it, it's it exists all through the universe, but it only comes into a measurable form um, through the process of matter being utilised or created yeah. or, or manipulated in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but the law itself still exists even if no matter existed. Yes. So yes, the law absolutely. is still present. Yeah. So God being the creator of the framework, the architect, if you want to call it for yep. a better word, yep. that, would that mean then God is actually the universe? Because it has the power, the ability to create. 
Well, what I'm saying is the universe that we perceive as the universe is the physical and spiritual and soul-based universes that I've described there. They are all they all exist um, at because of the laws that exist. But but God existed before these universes existed, and God existed before the laws because God created the laws. So so the reality is, um, the people who want to see God as a, a non uh, per, a, a being without, or not, not even a being, but as matter or, or, or as a combination of everything in the universe, the problem with that concept is that what happened before the universe was created? Did this God exist then? Mm. And I'm saying, no, God existed before the creation of any universe and God had personality and the ability to create and I've still yet to discover how much power God has, but, but it's self-evident in all of the different universes, that God must be greater in power than all of the power that's in all of the universes combined. And and to me, that is a very like fascinating subject of discovery, which I'm still personally working through in discovery. Um, but, but God herself certainly must have existed before the even, even the laws existed that created the framework for the universe to exist. Does that make sense? So you've got God's existence, then you've got the laws coming into being, which allow for a framework, and then you've got the f- what the framework creates through a process of integration between God and ourselves, God's children. So if you use the analogy of the architect then, you're saying that just as an architect comes along and draws, draws plans... plans they're separate from the plans, but those plans will go on to create a whole other structure. Exactly. Um, which God is the... So God's the person who planned and guided that mm. creation. Um, they aren't the creation. Yep. But, but it's even more wisdom. complex than that. Yes. It's sort of like getting these plans, right? So you've got the plans, God's drawn out these plans, but God's also allowed for people, for his children, to modify the plans... Mm. However, if they modify the plans in a negative context, in other words, they modify the plans out of harmony with love, then there is a feedback system of pain and suffering which they can measure, which, which, which then causes them to want to, not, not through any pressure from any other source, causes that same person who modified the plan in a negative way to modify the plan back to, <laughs> to suit the original concept, if you like. But, but also... The beauty is that God allows for this plan to be built upon because the laws themselves are structured in such a way that the what the laws create can be built upon and, and modified um, because the laws are so complicated and complex that allows for every single possibility that humankind could ever imagine. And that's the incredible part about all of this, like anything you can imagine to do whether it's totally as unloving as you can imagine or as loving as you can imagine, everything that you can imagine to do, God allows you to create. Mm. However, if it is unloving, God, God also gives you this automatic feedback system of pain and suffering to show you that the creation was unloving, but it's of your choice whether you continue the unloving creation or not. But, but the laws even allow for that to occur, but don't allow for that to occur permanently. They don't allow for that to occur it's a temporary thing because sooner or later the pain associated with creation in a negative direction will cause you to correct your negative direction and create in more positive directions. So some people would view that as being quite a controlling aspect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's not like God just gives you the free will to. Well, God gives you the free will to do anything you wish, but God also is not an anarchist. And most people believe that this, there, there is this whole new age concept that basically God is an anarchist who gives you free will to do anything you want, and that is not strictly correct. God is giving you free will to do anything you want, but God's not an anarchist in the sense that God doesn't allow your will to permanently affect anybody else or any other part of the universe So, in, in a negative direction. God mm. does allow for your creations in a loving direction to permanently change the universe. But God, the way God has created this framework, God does not allow 
any of your unloving creations to permanently affect the universe. So God always maintains. So God's maintaining not not anarchy. It is theocracy. <laughs> like God, God is maintaining her universe, and also does not allow for any permanent destruction of the universe. So if God, if man understood technically all the aspects, all the laws of love. Mm-hmm. Would man have the potential to create a universe? Yes. As what God would do. Yes, certainly. So the possibility exists. The possibility exists, and I feel I feel quite strongly that actually that's what God's teaching us to do. God is eventually teaching us all to become parents of other souls. Like that that to me is the underlying purpose of all of this. God God is firstly engaging her love with us so that we can get to a condition of love that that, that is a subset of her condition. And when we get to a certain amount, my, my current concept is that once we get to a certain condition of love, God then allows us, because we now understand the laws, to create a framework similar to what God has created, that where, where we can create a framework of creation of our, of our own children, even uh, souls, as souls, not as, lot of, not as humans, like, not as the sexual act here on earth, but, but rather as children of a unified soul. And that is the potential that we then can create universes for those particular children to exist in, in exactly the same manner as God has done with us. And do you feel that the process that you both returned, I know Ruth, yeah. to your, <laughs> but, but given that you're both here, are you, going, are you aware of the processes that are occurring through your existence on Earth at the moment, of how it's changing the universe and that that potentiality will be? Certainly. And because myself and Mary are still working through our unhealed emotions, which is a part of the laws that God has created. Like every every time a person incarnates onto the earth, there is a, a absorption of the unhealed emotions of its environment into the soul. Those have to be consciously worked upon to, to be eradicated from the soul. And myself and Mary, as are any anybody else who's consciously doing this, going through this conscious process of clearing away those particular injuries, the more we do that, the more we remember. And the more we remember, the more we can impart. So right at this stage, I'm just giving you a very, very sort of brief summary of mm. a concept of the universe, and, and we've yet to even deal with the technicalities of the universe itself. Um, but as time goes on, I hope to eventually give the mathematical formula involved with the, uh, the operation of this universe and, and the scientific uh, evidence about the universe and how that can be discovered and the many other factors about the universe, which will all come to me. And, I, you know, I have a, remem- a remembrance of of knowing all of those particular things, and so they, I feel quite strongly once I deal with these particular emotions, they'll all come to me, and and then they'll be able to be investigated and mathematically proven. Um, so, so, but we've got to go through this process. So, so you're talking to a person at the moment who's still going through the process, so therefore, because I'm still going through the process, I can't remember everything that I know um, and just like you can't remember everything you know because you're sti- because there are some emotions within you that block certain things that you remember mm-hmm. um, from from being conscious inside of you and and we're going through the same process as well so as we go through that process there'll be more and more and more information that can be shared in many different areas not just in what we call spirituality but I'm talking in, in physics and in chemistry and in, in mathematics and in all these different areas of, of endeavour, there is much to share and, and there's a lot of knowledge that's available um, and it's just a matter, from our perspective, as, of remembering it. And that's because all of those different things that you've related, physics and science and mathematics and all of those things are still governed by those laws that yep. God has set out. That's uh, and, and the highest of which being divine love. So yep. all of all knowledge in those things yeah. we would would be added to us. Yes. So so, so I see a, a, see a, um, a science today generally sees religion and science as sort of separate issues. Um, I've always viewed it as one issue. Like all religion must be scientific to, to actually be correct. So there has to be provable. It has, there has to be proof. There has to be tangible evidence. And, uh, and this is the problem, I feel, with many forms of religion on earth, is that they've been conceived in the minds of men, but, but without very little physical, tangible evidence. And so many of the doctrines, even in Christianity and other forms of religion, are actually just doctrines. They're actually just the ideas or concepts of men rather than being the truth, if you like, of the universe. The beauty of the truth 
if the, if God exists, and I'm saying God does because I, because I have a personal relationship with God, but if God does exist, then it would also make sense that everything that is communicated from God will always make sense. It will always be logical. It will always be scientific. It will always be mathematical. It will always be loving. It will, it will always be wise. It will always be powerful. It will always be all of these different things that God is. And as a result of that, um, there's, there's just huge amounts of things we can discover if we discover this relationship with God first. I feel that in terms of the discovery of the universe, we need to look at a few basic principles. One is this. There, we have a number of options to discover the universe. One option is for us to come up with an idea, try to prove it, and then hopefully we can prove it, but we don't. Most of the time we struggle with even proving it. And so we have to hold on to it as a theory until it can be further proven. And unfortunately, uh, many people go through thousands of years of that where nothing is proven. They have a whole list of theories about, for instance, the creation of the universe but, uh, or, the, or the coming of existence, let's call it, for the, for the people who are uh, not religious and don't believe in God and who believe themselves to be atheists. Um, they view it as the coming into existence of the universe. Well, that, that particular process is just based on theory upon theory upon theory upon theory. And, and unfortunately, what we've got to do is go through this process of trying to disprove the theory or try to prove the theory, one of the mm. two. Mm. Uh, that's the generalised, accepted view of scientific process. Now, to me, that's the least scientific thing you could do because all you need to do first is prove whether God exists or not. Right? If you can prove that God exists, then the next thing that makes logical sense is to connect to that God and ask God how God created the universe. <laughs> right? Which I is that not obviously logical? Have not done. Yeah, is that not logical? <laughs> right. Um, so, so, so the main question becomes then: Does God exist? How can I how can I prove whether God exists? That's what I taught in the first century, and that's what. I mean, that's, that's the, your statement that the greatest secret of the universe is actually God. But it's actually not even reflected in, in the man's definition in the exactly. concise Collins Dictionary. Yeah. There is no mention of God. Exactly, exactly. And, and there is this concept uh, through in most people, many people just have this very, very hazy view of God. Even most religious people have a very, very hazy view of God. They, you know, when you ask them to tell, to tell you about God, Many people have a lot of difficulty, struggle from that point on. And, um, and then if you start judging God through what these people who believe in God do, then they do often very many atrocities on the planet. And if you start judging God as being the God they say God is, then of course that particular God can't exist. So um, then you're left with this only other concept, which is atheism, God mustn't exist. And what I'm saying is that, no, God exists, but there is only one way to prove it, all right? And that is to actually receive love from God, to go through this process, which I described in the first century, to receive love from God. Once you have ironed out the issue of whether God exists, now all you need to do is ask that God for how everything works, and that God will tell you. And all the details about the universe. All the details the about the universe, all of this, all of the laws that I've described, all of those things, all of them come into um, into your awareness, and they are all provable. They are all actually stuff that you can go out and then experiment with and prove very rapidly. You see, God never created a process that was going to be difficult for us to discover truth. What we have done is we've made it difficult by doing one thing. And that one thing is disconnecting from God. Mm. And so what we've done is we've only left ourselves open to that other thing that is the only thing possible once you disconnect yourself from God. And once you disconnect from yourself from God, the only thing that is possible to discover the universe is experimentation. It's the only thing. So it's sort of like standing in the house and pulling it apart Brick by brick, brick or plank by plank, and going, now how did this all go together? How did they make this? Instead of it's like, like trying to reverse engineer yeah. everything, and we could look at the plan or look at the, the architect, 
ask the architect directly mm. and he would reveal yeah. so much about how it's all, yeah. yeah. So if I, I picked up this uh, whiteboard marker and I gave that to you, Anto, and I said, now you tell me everything that's in it <laughs> and how it was made and what kind of processes it went through to be made and so forth and so forth. I've got a lot of research to do. <laughs> There's a lot of research. Right? Now, if you, if you could not ask anybody and you were just prevent, presented with that and somebody told, told you, asked you, how would you go about making that particular thing? It would be a very difficult task. It would be a very, very difficult task because you'd have to reverse engineer the entire thing. Hmm. Understand all the chemical... You'd have to understand all its chemical properties, all its physical properties. You'd have to understand the manufacturing process that went into it. Everything. You'd have to understand everything before you could make exactly that. So in your existence, you've managed to talk to God about all that? So now we're going to get some more on the architect at work. Yeah. Architect at yeah. work again. <laughs> well, what I'm proposing to you is that it okay. would make sense to you, for you, if you really wanted to know how this works, it would make sense for you to go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's really right. Not revealing it today. <laughs> yeah, not revealing it. But it would it make sense, wouldn't it, for you to go, this is... The best way for me to find out how this works is to really connect to God. It's to find out who made it and go and ask him. Yeah. <laughs> we'll probably just phone it. <laughs> anyway. Um, time out. Anyway. Time out.